Um, so I'm excited to share with you all some new research directions from KVS. Um, so our last proposal focused on mechanisms contributing to resilience from an ecosystem ecology perspective, a community ecology perspective, and an evolutionary ecology perspective. And we did this because I'd argue that ecologists working in these different subdisciplines have somewhat differing views about what contributes to resilience. So for example, at our site, if I asked an ecosystem ecologist like my colleagues, Phil Robertson or Steve Hamilton, what contributes to resilience to drought at KBS, they'd say it's all about resources. So that first mechanism in the circle on the left. And they'd say it's about all about soil organic matter. But if I asked a community ecologist, they might say it's all about diversity. And if I asked an evolutionary ecologist, they might say that it doesn't matter how many species are in a system if those individual populations can't rapidly adapt to novel environmental conditions. And one of the cool things is that each of these mechanisms have, has parallel mechanisms um, in act, operating in, in the social science realm. So an economist might not talk about resources, but they would certainly talk about capital. You know, a social scientist might talk about human adaptation in much the same way someone like me would talk about Darwinian adaptation. And so um, in this next phase of the KBS research, we're really trying to address both of the, all of these mechanisms from an ecological perspective and also from a social science perspective. And this work builds on our long-term data. Like many of the grassland sites, we see a, um, a pretty strong signature of historical drought in our long-term data sets. But over the past several decades, our treatments have also diverged in their resilience to drought. So uh, for example, if we look at our four row cropping treatments, um, the no-till treatment is the most resilient to the 2012 drought in terms of soybean yields. And a big question is, is why? So Phil Robertson would argue that it's all about soil organic matter. It's all about resources. And because it's Phil, I'm guessing that he's probably right, but it could also be because of the microbial diversity that perhaps increased in concert with those increases in soil organic matter. Or maybe it's because rhizobium populations have increased, increasing evolutionary potential. We can start to answer this question of why um, with new experiments that were supposed to go out this year, but will likely be delayed because of COVID. Um, with these uh, rainout exclosures. So that simulate these growing season droughts that we see signatures of in our long-term data sets. And we're coupling these rainout treatments with um, experimental manipulations that should manipulate the strength of those different mechanisms of resilience. So for example, by adding soil carbon, um, increasing or decreasing microbial diversity. So that's where we're going and kind of the next big set of experiments that we plan to set up. But for the remainder of the time, I really wanna zoom in on the mechanism of adaptation and how we can use LTR sites and how we can study adaptation and evolution more generally at KBS and also elsewhere. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this guy. This is Rich Lenski. He's the brainchild behind the most famous evolution experiment in the world. Um, what you might not know though, is that Rich was setting up his long-term evolution experiment at this exact same time that the KBS LTR was getting started. Rich was doing his work 65 miles away on the main MSU campus instead of down at KBS. But just like Rich's E. coli populations, which have been evolving in his class, in his lab for more than 30 years now, animals, plants, uh, microbes have been evolving in the treatments down at the KBS LTR for just as long. And the cool thing about this is that we can now go in and we can look for evolutionary change. And here's one example of that. So what we did was we went into Kay Gross's nitrogen addition experiment that she started back in 1988. And we isolated rhizobia populations from plots that had been fertilized for more than two decades, shown there in the red bar, and rhizobia populations from adjacent control plots that had not been fertilized. And what we find is that rhizobia that had been evolving in these high nitrogen environments for more than 20 years had evolved to be less cooperative, just as theory predicts. So in other words, they provide fewer growth benefits to their plant hosts. So that plus N on that x-axis, that's not us directly fertilizing those plants. That's where the rhizobia originated from. That's their evolutionary history. Um, these types of experimental evolution studies can also be coupled uh, with resurrection experiments. Resurrection experiments take some planning. It requires knowing something about that original source population before it started to evolve. But in some cases, like in plant evolutionary studies, it's relatively easy to save those original source populations. And that's what KBS did when they started their bioenergy experiments. So they saved seeds that were used to install some of those initial treatments. 
So this is data from one of the prairie treatments. They basically restored prairies and, and were interested in using these prairies as, as biofuels. Um, but because they saved the seeds, a graduate student, Susan Magnoli, can come along years later, wake those seeds up, and see how the current populations have diverged from that original source they were planted with. So in this figure, the original source is in the gray bar. Two restored prairie populations that had been evolving for six years are the red bars and the blue bars. And the restored prairies have evolved to flower earlier than their original source population. They also differ in a number of other traits, including how they interact with soil mutualists. The final way we can study evolution in, these, in LTRs or elsewhere is to actually measure natural selection in the wild. And we do this by estimating fitness on an individual, measuring a trait on the individual, and looking at that trait fitness relationship. And that slope of that line, the direction of the line, tells us the strength and direction of natural selection acting on the trait. And the cool thing about this approach is that it allows us to predict future evolutionary change. So experimental evolution resurrection experiments, they allow us to ask questions about how evolution has occurred in the past. But by measuring natural selection, we can predict how evolution should happen in the future. And this is particularly cool in the context of LTR sites because so many of our sites simulate future global changes. So we can start to investigate how these global changes will affect the evolution of plants, animals, microbes. So these are some of the approaches that we'll be using at KBS study adaptation along with diversity and resources as mechanisms of resilience. Thanks.